I am the Vet Corps navigator here. And what that means is that in the Puget Northwest, there are Vet Corps navigators at each college. So when veterans are transitioning from the military and ready to go to college, I assist them in educational benefits, housing, child care, um, clothing. In fact, up on the third floor, you'll find the Veterans Services Lounge, the Veterans Services Office. We have a closet for people looking for clothes to wear, um, baby food. We get a lot of donations, and we recently had a pop-up food bank that had over 50 participants here. So that really was enlightening to me. I didn't see food insecurity as um, such a huge need at this time. Um, I've been focused on homelessness, and I do a lot of initiatives in grassroots in Bellevue and in Seattle because homelessness is not seen supposedly in Bellevue. But regardless, this, um, anyway, so I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I served in the Army. Um, for the Golden Knights and Blue Angels, I was a nurse for them where, while they were out practicing and jumping out of planes, and I was terrified because I was 17 years old. My dad had to sign for me to go. I was 15 when I went in the Army. Um, I took that first year to do my medical training, and then I was put out in the workforce. I was in Yuma, Arizona. It's absolutely gorgeous, wild mustangs. A beautiful experience and then I got deployed yeah so I said to my commander you know I'm thinking about not getting deployed and maybe I'll just get pregnant <laughs> but you guys can't send me and then I realized I could get um, killed in Fifth Ward Houston Texas which is where I'm from so I said get yourself together and get deployed and do what you signed up to do so I went to Bosnia during the ethnic cleansing between the Bosnians and the Serbanians, and it was a really intense experience because there were landmines on either side of our vehicle. We had vehicle rollovers, we had explosions. Um, you experience a lot when they tell you to pack up your bag and get ready to go, and you don't know when you're coming back. I'm single, I don't have kids, and that's something I thought about my future. Is, is this where I will continue to be? And what is tomorrow going to look like for me? So, needless to say, when I got out of the military, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, it was a journey because initially they said, well, you're possibly bipolar, or maybe um, it's just anxiety. So it's a lot of trying to figure it out, and there are a lot of pharmaceutical drugs, and when you're working with um, different drugs and chemicals, it affects your brain, it affects your mental status, it affects the way you view the world, and I realized that I was not growing um, within the VA healthcare system. So I found a new way to live my life. I changed what I ate. I became vegan. I ate um, less meat. I stopped taking my drugs with the assistance of mental health professionals. And I started to grow. I transformed. I became a yoga teacher. I'm also a registered nurse. And I also work here in this community helping other veterans because there was a time when everything around me was really dark. And I would wake up in the morning with a real sense of heaviness. And each day that I was less heavy, I realized I'm getting better. And I call it um, walking hopelessness. Because you, you kind of feel like no one cares. You kind of feel like you're alone in this journey. And then as an African-American woman, in my community where I would seek support, whether it be spiritual, I was told that um, depression and stress is not real. You should have faith to overcome what it is that you're dealing with. And once I got more into medicine and science, I realized, well, there are 
serotonin levels within me that are imbalanced. There's something going on that I need to adjust that I'm not getting just from talking about it and just from being prescribed medication. So I, I worked through it and needless to say, I'm here and I'm, I'm more balanced than yesterday. <laughs> Every day you're new. Um, and I still have trauma and things that I'm dealing with, but I've gotten busy and in my community, I am on the Bellevue Diversity and Inclusion Board where we give advice and initiatives to policies and procedures being made in my community. And I teach yoga over at the Mac Center in downtown Seattle and I'm at peace now with my journey. So I'm not quite sure what this should look like, but I thought it should be a conversation that was intimate and where we could be raw. This is a, a safe space where you should feel free to express yourselves and ask whatever questions it is that you may have so that we can overcome certain thoughts or ideologies that we have about military veterans, about women in the military. Um, I woke up this morning very raw when I turned on the news and I saw that there were there was another shooting in California and I called my mom and I'm her primary caregiver and I she I said, Mom, you know, I, I have this sense of fear in me and fear is false evidence appearing real. And I said, well, maybe I need to purchase a, a, a gun. Maybe I need to arm myself. I'm single and all these shootings in California is my neighbor. And I'm starting to feel a little nervous. And I'm on public transit. There's a little bit of everything around me. And then I realized that whether it's on the streets of Seattle or whether it's on the streets of Iraq. It's very necessary for me to show up authentic, for me to show up with a purpose and to realize that all I really have honestly is right now at this moment in here with you. Right now is guaranteed. This is these few minutes I'm speaking with you. And there are a lot of people who don't identify as veterans in this community and don't take advantage of 50% off their tuition because they don't want to be identified as someone who has PTSD, someone who's dealing with mental health issues. And it's very rapid in our community right now. And people are afraid because they don't see the support and they're walking hopelessly. So I've taken up enough of the conversation and I will let Tiffany speak and I think I'll have a seat and get a bit more comfortable. There's water for me. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yay. So I'm not very good at these things. Um, and you guys are gonna have to bear with me because like it is an incredibly intimidating thing to like have all these people just looking at you. You're like, okay, don't screw up or forget anything. Um, so the talk was about the stereotype of veterans, which is fun because I'm like this weird mixed bag of stereotypes. And when you actually, if you actually serve or participate in the military, like you're a dependent, if you're the child of sister or brother, if you get to go on post for like holidays or stuff, go on a base, you realize like stepping into a different world and a different culture. It's awesome and amazing. And it's so mixed back. Like I was in a medical unit. So we had a lot of females. We had a lot of single moms. We had a lot of grandmas staying with parents. We had a lot of dual military and pop up days are like the best because you have these awesome, amazing, authentic foods from around the globe that you are never gonna find anywhere else. Like, ooh, it would be made from scratch, like these huge pans or this quote unquote Spanish rice. Amazing. I have no idea how it was actually made, but I can tell you whose mom made it. 
but it's this awesome blend of cultures to be in the military and to be in that and you literally represent everything when you join the military you are joining a part of a society that is invested in the united states and really well funded because you get things like <coughs> You know, bodily autonomy, you get to say what happens with you, you have human rights, uh, you get to raise your family. If you have a family, you get paid more money because they realize that the cost of living is more. They provide you with housing. If you're sick, you get to stay home. Uh, they have cool things like compulsory medical care. Like, you are going to go and you are going to get checked up and we are going to pay for it and you are going to get your flu shot because that's the responsible and right thing to do. They have literal books and books and books on all the right things to do and you have to do them because that's what you agree to when you join the military. It's amazing. It is the best thing. <laughs> Like her experience is different than mine. I am very <laughs> I'm pleasant because the reality is, is that I am a single mother with three children who all three three of those children were products of single moms. I'm part of the poverty cycle. I grew up in nowhere fucking Oklahoma. Moved all around. I know how to grow food in my backyard because I am just a little bit too much fucking country. I raise rabbits because we're food insecure. I'm a huge advocate for all of these things because besides the fact that I am a chick, like, I'm pretty country and I'm pretty stereotype. I'm garden variety white people from random Oklahoma. My family's been there since before it was a state. But the military gave me this incredible ability to know my own self-worth because nobody gave a flying fuck what was happening between here and here, they just wanted me to pick up my bag and go do my job. Like, none of that mattered. Nobody cared about what color I was. It's like the Marines, I love the Marines. Um, they say that you, there's no black and white, only light green and dark green, only green. There are some fun things about Marines. Overall, it's just never, never say no to a drunk Marine when they want to hug you. That's the only thing you can say about Marines. Um, they're the best people ever. And they get stuff done, and being in the military is great because, like, I was required to get the vaccination, and you were, there was no religious exemptions. Just do the right things you agree to. It was, like, really cool because I got care, my kids got care, everyone, for the first time in my life, I had everything I needed. I had help with food if I needed it. That's why we have support systems like this dripping into the civilian world because in the military, this is what we had. We had leaders, we had people who taught us how to adult. You have people who teach you how to do financing. Your council once a month on making goals and improving yourself. If you have a good leader, you can go from being an uneducated individual with very little future to a sergeant major easily. And they are required to look at you past your color, past your gender, past everything else, because it is the fundamentally right thing to respect people as individuals. And the military gives you that. Like, that is the coolest part about it. Like, I always sit there and think, you know, after all that medical care I got, like, I was actively breastfeeding children, and you know what? The President of the United States said the boss, my boss, my commanders, my sergeants, anybody else, were required by regulation to let me pump the first year of my kid's life. That's awesome. And I got time off because it said that those are fundamental rights and the military gives us to that. And then hopefully it drips over to the civilian world because there are so many people in the military who just want to do the right thing and want to make it better. And that is the commonality that we share. It has nothing to do with what we are on the outside. Like the stereotype for veterans is that we're some damaged, misused, crotchy old dude. Yeah, that's sometimes true, but other times for people like me and people like her and people like several veterans that I see in this room that I know. And that's the awesome thing about it is we are such an amazing diversity. We are an investment in the American culture and we will do the right thing because all the things that the veterans share is our sense of service, our sense of wanting to make things better, our sense of picking those up to our left and to our right and making sure that they go with us and that we compensate for the amount of evil and bullshit that we see in the world and we know how great our lives are and how much we want to hold on to that liberty and those rights and those amazing abilities to unabashedly be like, hey, I'm a veteran. I am very clearly a female. I'm a chick. That has nothing to do with it. And the cool part about it is all the things we share don't have to do with our outside things, but the things that are 
important to us our like sense of community our sense of service our sense of wanting to be good people and have people be good around us that's what stereotype of that is. so since this is a conversation i didn't want it to totally evolve around us talking to you so at this time i think we can open up the forum for hello welcome I, I, you. I didn't know if like you were just speaking in the <laughs> uh, no, come up here. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> so, do you guys have any questions either for us or uh, first you want to wait after Chantel? Yeah, I'm going to introduce myself okay, real quick. I'm um, sorry, no wait, guys. My name is Chantel Deshutter. Um, I'm the president. Here we go. Um, I'm the president of the uh, Student Veteran Union, and um, yeah, um, I served <laughs> in the United States Army for uh, six years after duty. It's like welcome to the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I was just opening up the floor. I was oh, okay. I'm sure everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So why don't you come sit up here? No. Um, so I recently <laughs> met a vet who um, I heard someone say thank you for your service. And I know from just talking with this person that they had a very difficult time. And so they don't like to hear that. Um, how should we address people? Should we assume we should say thank you for your service when we hear that because we think it's a polite thing to do and a lot of people will like that. But that's something that I hadn't heard before. So how do I navigate that? How do I respect people who, upon meeting them, may or may not appreciate that, hearing that? Okay. <laughs> that's how I answer that. So, well, personally, I, don't have a problem if someone was to come up to me and say, hey, thank you for your service. Um, I feel like there are other things going on um, in this world that we didn't get this, but I heard about that. It just doesn't make any sense. But as far as how to navigate or how to approach somebody, you know, if, like how to um, address them, like if you want to thank them for their service, like not to say thank you, but I mean, I guess you can, um, you can show it in a different way, like, hey, can you want to invite me to have a coffee or, you know, something to that extent. I don't know. Um, that's just something that, you know, perhaps I would try to do. So that's really funny. Um, working in this position <coughs> as a core navigator, I um, have encountered individuals who are still dealing with their triggers. Um, and it's a process. And, and that's another part of not identifying your experience because a lot of soldiers were put in positions that in civilian world, they made choices they probably wouldn't have made. So I think, especially with Veterans Day coming upon us on Monday, um, just holding that space for someone, a smile, um, just showing your support in another way. If, if someone doesn't need that verbal, maybe it can be physical, hold the door open, just being more humane, having more compassion, paying it forward. It's the simple things because we're all processing different things together and we all receive gratitude in a different way. So a lot of times it, it's for our own fulfillment that we want to say thank you for serving, which is <laughs> something I would never do, but thank you, good looking out. Mm -hmm. um, but like she, Chantel said, a cup of coffee or Starbucks card, if it's something that's on your heart to do, or just holding space for that person, you know, whatever feels best for you. Yeah. Um, I kind of made following up on this, what you said about people having experiences that they are making choices they wouldn't make in civilian life. <clears throat> and I know we talk a lot about PTSD and about living in the body, and it seems to be a very physical thing. Um, I've read more recently of uh, the idea of moral injury. Um, so, so something that's maybe more philosophical, existential, uh, something I, I think I, I read this sub, um, title for this, it was sort of about coming back to civilian life after the experience of war. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if, if any of you have things to comment on about, uh, not tr trauma, so to speak, but ways that, um, yeah, maybe the existential, moral, philosophical values um, veterans have, how they could be challenged by the experience, not only just you know, being war, but being in the military. Are you referring to the question of like, once we have been in the military, what is the fundamentally right thing to do? Or are you referring to- That could be like very, yeah, very big general kind of, yeah. 
Um, I mean, like, I know that insert, I can't see you, because um, I know, I know in service that, like, there are several situations, like, I can think of situations, like, you're, there's, a, there's no right, right answer, like, you, and then you're limited by, like, resources and actions and all this other stuff, like, there are a lot of things that you're just like, well, oh, that turned out well, um, and those do happen, but, like, coming out of the military, I don't know that you can do, like, I know a lot of people have the need to continue doing well and continue doing good, and that's why they serve. Like, I can tell you things about several people in this room that just do things to make the world better, but that's like, it is morally good, and that's something that we just come to. So I've had experiences like that where I had to make a choice um, split second decision whether to pull the trigger or not to take someone's life and risk my life being taken. And what I realized, it, it, it comes to conditioning. When you are in the military, you're conditioned differently. Um, you practice and you do drills and you don't so much have time to use mental telepathy and, and think about your next decision. Yeah. And when that transfers, one sec, when that transfers into civilian life, um, sometimes that can be seen as erratic. Things that aren't such an emergency seem like an emergency when, when you're um, in that fight or flight, that adrenaline, that epinephrine, you're, you're at a heightened level on a constant basis. It affects your heart, it affects the hormones in your body, cortisol, epinephrine, everything. So I had to learn to come down. Like, yeah, you're running late for that movie appointment, but it's not that important, right? Like, this isn't life or death. Things used to always be life or death for me. And, and making those split second decisions didn't always require my conscience. So when I started, like I started doing yoga and I started grounding myself and seeking therapy and, and learning how to ground myself and techniques to work through things. And, and now I'm teaching at the Seattle Youth and Violence Prevention Initiative to teach youth and children how to control those emotions and aggressions when you, you just want that split section, second reaction. When you're being told what to do and you're directed, it's a lot easier than when you have to make that decision split second on your own. So it's it's about morals and your lateral inference, what you've experienced in your past. And, and you grow, you evolve, you change, and life experiences change you. But what I had to learn is to, first I had to learn to breathe, right? Um, I used to be anxious and, and, and I, I didn't breathe correctly. So I learned pranayama breathing, grounding myself, deep breaths, um, not so much of the harmful hormones being released and triggering my system, but controlling my emotions. Um, I did a class on neurological linguistic programming where I wasn't so emotional and passionate about everything which I still am, but I learned you scare people away with that, right? Yeah, you're passionate and that's great, but you have to meet people where they are. And and so I, I became conscious of how I made other people feel. It wasn't all about me. I had to let go of the ego. And, and that's how I overcame um, making those decisions and dealing with those emotions. And, and some things I'm not so proud of doing. Um, I have more great days than bad days. My good days outweigh my bad, and so I'm always thankful for that. Um, during my service, I woke up every day with a purpose, inspired, enriched. We saw over 10,000 soldiers and veterans before I left, and some of the things that I saw in that trauma unit, I can't take those things away from my brain and when I sleep. So having a peaceful night's sleep is enormous. So 
So I take my wins, whether how big or how small they come, and I'm so grateful. So an attitude of gratitude has gotten me really far. So what's in my past, I say that let that go. Don't don't let your brain beat you. It's like an undisciplined child. I have to control it. You know, just quiet down. I'm, I'm here now. Everything is safe. You're safe. Your environment is safe. I felt pace. I felt I know this young woman had a question back there. Oh, yeah, yeah. She did. sorry. Yeah. So when, when Tiffany was speaking about um, her experience and was commenting on, you know, there's no white, there's no black, I was wondering if um, folks who who were women of color could speak on whether or not that held true during their <laughs> I know. I, that's why when I said I was talking your about experiences the are not quite like mine. Army. No, yeah. The no. Marines, okay, so from my understanding, Marines are taught all of that, and every Marine I've ever met has confirmed, said that that's how they're treated, and there's a famous journal, but I always screw up his name, and I screw up the quote, so I won't do it. Um, so uh, the, the idea is nice, right? <laughs> but, you know, we have to come to the reality that... <clears throat> The people in the military, we all come from different walks of life. So you're dealing with all sorts of people, whether it, you know, you're dealing with a bigot, whether you're dealing with a, uh, you know, it could be anyone. But my experience was totally different. Um, <clears throat> you know, my I had a, a supervisor, she was a white woman, and um, she was threatened by black women in particular because her cousin was black. Like, and she felt as if black women were upset with the fact that she was with a black woman. Um, and she would specifically target the, uh, the women of color that were lower rank. <clears throat> so she was just, you know, she was a brand new staff sergeant and I was a specialist. So of course I was one of her targets. But, you know, you know, uh, growing up and coming where I come from, uh, I'm a woman first. And so um, I, you know, there's, I just, I have zero tolerance for any sort of disrespect. Um, <clears throat> but to make a long story short, there, she would just say these things. And I felt like she would never address another black woman, um, either the same rank as her, or, uh, or who has a, a higher rank than her, right? She would never address like those type of women. She would only address the, the woman that would like lower rank. And she would say the most outlandish shit. And I'm just, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, um, I'm sitting here saying to you, I'm like, that's such fucking toxic leadership. And it's like, it's such a classic style of like being abusive towards a person. And like, it sucks. And I'm sorry. Um, there's not really shit I can do about it, but listen. But it's, it's just so shitty that things like that are displayed. It's good that it's an open conversation. It's awesome that you can share, but it's just shitty that like some person affected your career and your military. Cause like theoretically it's supposed to be that way. And there's always an ass hat who ruins things. I get that. Well, she didn't, you know, here's the thing. It's, it sucks so bad that someone did that to you for that reason, because it's so fucking stupid. The unfortunate part about that whole situation is that I was deployed with this woman, and um, she was my, you know, she was my commander. And, um, yeah, that's a whole other story. Maybe a whole other different class if you can talk about that. <laughs> but, um, what was your, what was your experience like? Because obviously. Yeah, no, I, sorry guys, I got nothing no, on that cool. one. No, it's cool, no, no, it's <laughs> So, um. I, well, I recently went to a um, forum and it was called Under Your Skin. The New York Times did a documentary where they were talking about blinders. And I was one of those people, yes, I grew up in Houston, Texas, graduated from the University of Houston, and I wanted to believe that skin color doesn't matter. What's most important is how you treat other people, you get an education, you've served your country, you have your degree, you're not a baby mama, you're not stipulating that there's, you're not within that bracket that everyone else is trying to place you in. And I realized walking in Kirkland, Washington, at that time I was wearing a hijab, um, and I was called a nigger. And I said, wow, 
and I don't know, you know, it, it reminds me that in this skin, when I show up, I have to prove myself immediately, immediately. I have to go above and beyond. I have to give more than my cohorts that skin color is lighter than mine. It's reality. And seriously, when I walk out of the door and I live in downtown Bellevue, I remind myself, pay attention to your surroundings and someone could just walk up to you and take your life just because you're black. And so I deal with the frowns and when I first moved here, I was, hi, how are you doing? Oh yes, just Southern lovely, great, happy, just very charismatic. And I realized, well, people aren't responding to you. And it used to hurt my feelings. And then I said, well, it's only because you live in the Pacific Northwest, they call it the freeze and, and people have their things that they're going through. But regardless of your race, regardless of your religion, regardless of your country of origin, we all have stereotypes that we're overcoming as a woman, as a minority, as an immigrant. Right now, that's a huge topic in society. And it's so real because I'm looking at humanity and saying, what direction and course are we going? Who and what is going to change? The gun violence. Is the NRA going to say something? Like yesterday, wasn't there another shooting? Mm -hmm. And this is the only what the media is telling us. So who, what are we waiting for? A miracle? Who's the Superman? Who's going to step up? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm glad we're having conversations about this now. I'm glad that I'm comfortable and I'm, I'm no longer delusioned with my blinders on thinking that I'm not being judged that in spite of how great or how good I try to be, some people are just not gonna like, you know, you're not gonna please everybody. It's just not gonna happen. So I had to start having more compassion for myself, for Kiana, showing my love and grace for me in the morning. Like I had to let go of expensive weaves and perming my hair and, and trying to be someone who I, like I wasn't. Oh, no, 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 like this is beautiful. Like this is nothing. <laughs> oh, I used to be worried my tracks were showing. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, is that? <laughs> Just the small things that used to stand in my way, I started letting go and, and, and the stereotype that my hair had to be straight and silky for me to be accepted. Small things, maybe to other people, but big transitions for me. That's really good. Yeah. Do you want to hear a different reason? Or do you uh, yeah, like I used that? to be beyond sight. <laughs> 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 like, 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 I don't know yeah. what they're called, but they're so pretty. Yeah, they are. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's real. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned that this week, I don't think you mentioned the number, but that can take 50% off of tuition. Yes. There is a certain number of veterans that are not identified as yes. veterans. Yeah. And that's taking advantage of that. Yeah. How do you know that? Do you know what percent people are Well, because I'm here on the ground. So I'm at the Maritime Academy, and sometimes I go over to Wood Shop and they come to me and they talk to me about experiences that they've had in their classroom when they've spoken to other people and in other campuses, how it made them feel isolated, alone, and judged. So I, I try to find resources for them if that's something that they choose not to do. And to me, I'm thinking, God, it seems so simple. Why wouldn't you? Right, your GI Bill's exalted, and you want to go back to school, this is a great opportunity. And each um, city, county, country, they all have different uh, resources. Like in Texas, after your GI Bill is exalted, you have the Hazelwood exemption, which will pay for your tuition and fees. 
fraternity. You can get your PhD. Pretty great, but yeah. at the same time, you have to live in Texas before you join. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have to live there before you join. Yeah, yeah, you have to be a resident. You do. Yeah. Um, a lot of to answer the thing about the number, I know that you know, but like not just this school, but other schools. Unless you're utilizing your GI Bill, sometimes even if you identify as a veteran, they won't steer you in the right place. No. So like, it's a mixed bag of either. You say that you're a veteran, and then they just send you to the like everything is. You should go talk to these people, and then you're like, but I I need books, and they're like, no, go talk to them. Okay, or they're just like, oh, that's nice, you're a veteran, and you're not told about support programs, so it's inconsistent, and that's I I believe that's one of the reasons why we have a tendency like to group and community up um, so much, despite all of our differences. We're just like. Oh, we network a lot. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm Senior Army Veteran. Um, so before I came here, uh, this is a little late. Uh, regarding the whole series, I was with that. Regarding the shooting that happened last night, I was told that the shooter was a veteran. Mm. Now, yeah, when that was told to me, I didn't know how to respond especially being so close to Veterans Day, being kind of like the local uh, veteran expert in my group of uh, classmates, um, and trying to kind of sh like show them that we're not psychopaths, you know, we're not, um, especially a lot of people that uh, know me, they know I came from combat um, MOS, and I'm constantly trying to tell them, it's like, like yeah, I, I live with PTSD, I, I, you know, a lot of us do. How would you? Because like, like when I was trying to tell him, it's like, for me to like tell him this, uh, it's hard. Um, yeah. How would you kind of diffuse that situation? Diffuse, uh, I guess, the the discourse amongst veterans when they hear veteran now. Now they're going to correlate with this recent shooting. They're like. Oh shit. And that's how I feel all the time. And yeah. I'm usually kind of nervous saying that I'm a veteran mm -hmm. as, since I got out because yeah. of that stigma of, you know, they're historically violent. And, you yeah. know, uh, we don't need war. You know, we don't, all this stuff. So, how would you guys go about that? You know, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> because of the shooting that happened, yeah, there's always going to be that stigma surrounding it, you know, like, you know, the veterans. But, What's that famous saying? Like that one uh, rotten, spoiled apple doesn't win all the competition. Is that friends holding the bunch? Well, right. one bad apple actually does spoil friends, but that's not the point. <laughs> but what I'm, what I'm trying to <laughs> right. But what I'm trying to say is like, I, I get what you're saying. It, it's it's hard because that statement is always going to be there. But like obviously, like we're not all psychopaths. I mean, you just have to be straight up. Like I'm I'm a firm believer in communication. And I feel like as long as people are just straight, like, it's easy for me to say because I've always been like this, but to just be straightforward and to just be honest. Can I? No. Okay, so I'm sorry, and this is gonna suck. Um, we do know how to kill you, and we know how to use guns. It's a reality. We were trained to do it, but we choose not to on a daily basis. It's super fucking easy. And the reality is, the wackadoos who are killing people are not practiced at killing people, and they weren't trained how to handle guns, and somehow they managed to do it anyway. We're not any scarier than we were yesterday. You don't know how, no, have to know how to use a gun to be a fucking moron and kill a bunch of people. But we know how to do it, and we're on your side, and a lot of people who are veterans just advocate for not being wackadoos and not shooting people. I'm pretty sure there's a consensus on that. And it's a really, really shitty, hard, bad conversations with a bunch of people being assholes. But don't be scared. Please don't be scared of us. Second one is a veteran is more likely yeah. to kill themselves yep. than kill others. So that's very good. Did you want to hurts. introduce yourself? Please. I'm Dante. I work upstairs with the veterans and all these ladies. So just sit here. I'll be quiet. <laughs> it's not about me. <laughs> but it, it is true. Like, So I've actually been addressed and had that question presented to me, and I have some veterans that um, come to me because 
That's one of the reasons they don't want to identify. And one of the things that I realized that at, it's at the base of all of this is fear. Fear, I, the acronym I use is false evidence appearing real, right? Um, you can't, what I would say to my friends is that, you know, that's like saying every individual in this ethnic group are guilty of massacres and murders, right? Some people in this group have committed these crimes, but you can't be prejudiced. I, I have this sweatshirt and it says, prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. And what that means to me is that when you start to label a large group of people, then that's saying a lot to me about where your mental capacity is allowing your brain to go. Like open up your mind and realize there, they call them lone wolves. And, and we, we were warned about this, that it, it's not so much the radicals, but it's your neighbor, it's the person in the classroom with you, the, the lone wolf that was maybe bullied that um, probably is not socially inclined within a group of people that is starting to act out with their pain and saying, I'm miserable, and so this is what's gonna happen. I want you to be miserable too and not feel this pain with you. And we as people have to start recognizing and opening up our eyes and taking off the blinders and paying attention, it's so important. One of the things that kept me alive in the military was attention to detail. You had to be alert on all points, and it's a heightened sense. But you, in this day and age, it's very necessary that you pay attention to the small things. And I'm not saying you have to label all people, oh, that person works all black, and they're a vet, so let's watch that person. But more so, the quiet voice. Invite the quiet voice in your community. That person that's not speaking, find out what's going on with them. We need to realize that we're suffering individually, but at the end of the day, we all need each other in some way or another. But we're divisive and we think that we're individuals, but subatomically, we're all connected. And I won't get too deeper into the bad. Yeah, I could. But, but what, I, what I'm saying is that when you get in that situation, you stand strong because you made a decision based on your principles and your morals. Start with your why every morning, why you're here, why you get up. Keep pushing. Let your actions define you and not the actions of other people. And people that are your real friends are not gonna come at you with that question. And, and those that do, maybe they're coming from a, a different experience and just talk to them and say, listen, you, you gotta think broader, think bigger, think deeper. Get deeper. That is really important. Deconstructing better stereotypes. Right, and it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with Tiffany. Yeah, and Jimmy. Yeah, and Chuck. Me too, of course. Yeah. You, me. All of us. All of us. All of us. What do you have to say? You've been talking a lot. No, I mean you guys have been killing it. I just, I, I, I do want to hear more questions. Um, Questions, please. Well, that was a good I know there are five questions that people ask. Were you going to ask those? You can ask those. Oh, I have a few questions, but sure. um, one of them is kind of tangential, so I feel bad asking it now. But um, I was really interested. You said you went into the military when you were 15. Yeah. I was kind of curious about that. That seems really young. Yeah, so it's called the Delayed Entry Program. And my dad had to sign for me. And the recruiter said, Dad, yeah, you and your best friend, you guys are going to be rich. Sign up, you're going to get to travel, you're going to go to school for free, you know, like, ah. I mean, you kind of <laughs> <laughs> it didn't quite work out like yeah. that. Yeah, I did get to travel. I went to Paris. Like, I got to visit some great places, but I only saw my best friend once. It's called the Buddy Program. Yeah. <laughs> Don't oh. fall for it. <laughs> didn't quite 
Yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a little different. But yeah, I, I graduated high school early. I was 15, and right after graduation, I went straight to the next What was the other question? Uh, I was more along the lines of um, you were talking about like the whole thank you for your service yeah. concept. Um, I, it's interesting because we live in an interesting area where, where we're, we're alternately supposed to be very supportive of people and inclusive, but there is definitely this anti-military sentiment, which bleeds over into, I'm sure, veterans feeling not appreciated um, at some point. Um, but I guess if each of you, if you have any individual thoughts about um, kind of that divide between people who, who have served and who haven't, and maybe if you wish you could say something to people on that kind of divide, that at least I feel when, I'm, I'm not a veteran, so when I talk to people, I try to understand, but I also know that I'm not a veteran, so. I can say in two sentences for me, which is impressive. Um, don't waste my sacrifice, go fucking vote. She said that we should have this on Tuesday. Right? <laughs> they, they'll be, you can vote again. It comes back. They, I know, it's a weird concept, but just vote. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, let me just understand. You're asking, are you asking us what are our thoughts on people? The division between, because I, um, I think it's interesting. There's, there seems to be this, this tension of, of on, I don't know, I, I don't know how to describe it really, um, but sometimes, you know, people who have served feel misunderstood by people who don't, or, or who haven't, okay. and right. people who haven't, kind of like, oh, well, you know, they all think alike, or, or you know, I mean, it is that, that stereotype thing, but I, I think that there's this misunderstanding, and if you could say something, there was something you could say to let's say people who hadn't served, what would that be? Maybe one thing do or <clears throat> the army <clears throat> the army teaches you these, these core values and one of them is discipline, right? Not a whole lot of people are taught discipline. Um, I find myself oftentimes like when I'm talking to my kids, when I'm talking to my boyfriend, um, there's a way that I'm talking that I feel sometimes like it's it's normal in the military. But it, it may not be normal in like the household. Because um, I, I can come off of maybe demanding or just, you know what I mean? But, um, and I'm also, I, I, like, I realize like, I don't have much patience. Like as I've gotten older, I'm 32 years old, but as I've gotten older, um, like my patience has like been running out. So like, I just, I feel like I just get short sometimes, um, surprisingly. But, um, which is why cannabis is beautiful. <laughs> um, but uh, I, you know what, people, I just, I don't know, communication is key, and I'm also a very understanding person, so like, their experience might be different from mine, but like, if I, like, you, you're, you know, you haven't served, you know, I just, it's different, it's just a different lifestyle, and I don't expect you to understand, and so like, I'm, I'm intelligent enough to come at you and, and communicate with you, you know, um, on the level that you wouldn't understand what it's like being a <laughs> Is there, like, do you have an example of, like, just like how you guys talk differently? Then, like, that's not, not <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. No, I'm no, no. I can go with that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, we, we're trained and we're, like, built up to be direct. So, if we're talking to you, we get you with something direct and you don't, you want that compassion and empathy, but we're telling you exactly. We get to the point, it can hurt your feelings, but we're not trying to hurt your feelings, we're just cutting through all the bullshit. <laughs> so, I don't know, I can eat stories, but... And you I, swear a lot. Yeah. <laughs> not all of them. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, is there, uh, there was a question between those who are in combat versus those who, um, you know, who are in the combat versus those who aren't No. I uh, feel an adult. Not yeah. well. Yeah, I feel like there's a community. It's almost like a family. Um, you support each other. Yeah. In and out of the service. Um, when you meet a fellow service member, member or veteran, 
you feel at home in the room. There's just an unsung understanding within the atmosphere. I totally disagree with that. Isn't that I feel like there's a major difference between people who serve and people who among each other. There's like a huge kind of judgment. Um, just for um, anecdotal. Okay. If I can uh, comment on that, yeah. same from the combat side. Um, in the military, uh, when I was active duty, yes, we had that kind of sentiment, but that was usually during deployments, and you know, you're out on a mission, and then you come back to the pub, and then it's like, we just want to eat a hot meal, and yeah. all the Pepsi's gone because all the folks so it's took it. Uh, sorry if I'm just uh, <laughs> yeah, saying all these acronyms and weird words. <laughs> but once we got back from deployment, you know, uh, we started working with. Everyone else again, not secluded <laughs> in our little cops, not in our little platoons. Yes, it got a little bit better, and we got a little bit more inclusive. And um, I would say, it, like, by the time like one year after getting back from my last deployment, I, I didn't like see what experience they had as like, oh, combat pack, oh, no combat pack. Either way, I'm gonna teach you what you don't know. You're gonna teach me what I don't know. Yeah. And then once I got out, it's like. Cool, we're veterans. The only time I like hold a special case is when I find someone that's also in the East Side Airborne. There's a like, weird connection. <laughs> yeah. Airborne dudes. It's like, oh, you wore that stupid ass motor variety? It's like, it's, uh, hey, they weren't that bad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they I, were I, that I, bad because my ex husband had one. Did you have a question? Uh, no, I was just gonna go off what he said. Like yeah. our language is pretty off. Like every adjective starts with the word fuck. <laughs> uh, and and yeah. do you notice the people who are identifying, even saying something, the phrase is like to go off of, to caveat, to raise the hand. It's a form That's, of communication yeah. that we've yeah. come to and that we've been trained to do. Like even the rivalries that we have between branches and service and units, those basic psychology that's used to beam us up together and make us whole people. It is an entire society that exists within a society and we hide among you. Thank you so much for your time.